In today's episode we're finally going to switch from real mode to protected mode, which is a necessary step towards writing a 32-bit kernel. Before diving into it I would like to announce that I now have a personal website, which I will use to better organize my projects and showcase them to more people. In particular, part of my website is dedicated to Meltron, the kernel I'm working on. I think it's important to have a professional website for your projects, as it is the best way to make a mediocre project like mine seem a bit more serious, so that when the imposter syndrome kicks in, you start treating your own projects a bit more seriously. If you too want to have a professional website, you're in luck, because this video is sponsored by Hostinger. Hostinger offers a great deal of high-quality services, like their premium shared hosting service, which already comes at a very, very affordable price, but along with all the other yearly hosting plans, can be discounted up to 91% if you use the coupon code DIDELUS or the link conveniently situated in the description box. Their plans offer some very interesting features like free domain name and free SSL and 30-day money-back guarantee. Once you choose a plan and complete your order, setting up the website is very simple. You just need to claim your free domain in my case, I chose Mr.Dallion.com just because I wanted to make this joke. Good morning, Mr. Dallion! Mr. <laughs> you activated after all these years! Click on Setup and follow a few simple steps. Once you're done with that, you can activate your SSL certificate and have a look at the H panel. Here you can find some very important settings, manage your backups, and free email accounts. In my case, I have Good morning at mrdalliard.com, which, to be honest, makes me a tiny bit happier than it should. A thing that surprised me about Hostinger is the insane amount of tutorials and documentation they provide for free, so yeah, check them out! Take a moment to think about how useful BIOS functions are. There is one to print a character, there is one to read a character from the keyboard, there is one to read from the disk, there is one to change display mode, there are several BIOS functions that can be used to detect how much available memory we have. It would be a shame if we, say, couldn't use them anymore, for some reason. And the reason I'm saying this is because today we will be switching to protected mode and we won't be able to use BIOS functions anymore. From now on, it's not going to be as relatively simple as it was in real mode. But first of all, why are we switching and what is this protected mode thing? Protected mode is a 32-bit operational mode, so we can address up to 4 gigabytes of memory. We can implement things like paging and multitasking, although we're not going to do it in this series. Also, we're going to write in C, which is a very good thing, so it should be pretty much obvious why we're switching. So, how do we do it? First of all, before switching to protected mode, we need to define how segmentation is going to work after the switch. So, we just need to set a couple of registers to certain values, right? No. No, not really. You see, segmentation works in a bit of a different way in protected mode. Every segment has a set of permissions and properties that we need to set in a data structure called the Global Descriptor Table, or GDT. The structure of the GDT is a bit of a mess. Let's first talk about it with some degree of abstraction, and then we will move to the actual definition of the structure. We need to define a descriptor for each segment we're going to use in protected mode. A descriptor is nothing more than a list of properties of our segment. There are several memory management models and techniques to choose from at this point, the most common being paging, and you might want to read about the pros and cons of each model yourself. The one we're going to use is very similar to the tiny model we used in real mode, and it's called the flat memory model. The key part of the flat memory model is that we will treat memory as a single contiguous address space, so we're not really going to use segmentation. The thing is, the GDT must contain at least a description of the data and code segments, so that is what we're going to define. Let's talk about the code segment first. The first thing we need to define is the size of our segment and its location in memory. The two properties that we're interested in are called base and limit. The base of a segment is the 32-bit property that describes the starting location of our segment, in our case location 0, while the limit, which describes the size of our segment, is a 20-bit property and in our case we should set it to the maximum number that can be represented with 20 bits. The next properties are called present, privilege and type. Present is a single bit and it is 1 if the segment is used, so it should be 1 for every valid segment. Privilege is a 2-bit value from 0 to 3. This value is used to define sort of a segment hierarchy and implements memory protection. 
The highest privilege is 0, so we should set it to 0. Type is another single bit, that should be set to 1 if the segment is the code or data segment. This is the code segment, so we're going to set it to 1. The other properties of the segment are stored as flags. A flag is a single bit that represents a boolean property. We have two sets of flags, both 4 bits long. The first flags are the type flags. We will examine them bit by bit. The first boolean property is, will this segment contain code? This is the code segment, so we need to set this to 1. The second property is called conforming, and it asks, can this code be executed from lower privilege segments? As this is the highest privilege segment, we should set this bit to 0. Then we have readable. Can this segment be read, or is it only executable? If we set this to 1, we will be able to read constants defined in our code. The last bit is accessed. This bit is used by the CPU. It is set to 1 when it is using the segment. We should set it to 0 and let the CPU do its thing. The other flags are the following. Granularity. When this bit is set to 1, the limit is multiplied by hex 1000, so we can span a whole 4 gigabytes of memory. This is a good thing, so we should set it to 1. The second flag is, is this segment going to use 32-bit memory? Yes, so we set it to 1. We're not going to use the last two bits, so we will set them to 0. That's all we need for the code segment. The data segment descriptor is similar, we only need to change a few flags. The first type flag should be 0, as the segment does not contain code. The second one is not the conforming flag anymore, but the direction flag. When this flag is on, the segment becomes an expand down segment that grows downwards. We don't want that, so we'll set it to 0. What was the readable bit in the code segment descriptor is now the writable bit. It should be set to 0 if the segment is read only, but it is not, so we'll set it to 1. In order to define the GDT in assembly, we need to define each of these properties in a certain order. To do this, we will use the pseudo instruction DW, or define word, that defines 2 bytes, and DD, define double word, that defines 4 bytes. First of all, let's put a label at the beginning of our GDT. Its purpose will be clear at the end. Then, at the beginning of every GDT, there must be an empty descriptor. To define it, we just need to define 8 zero bytes. Then we should define the code descriptor. Here comes the confusing part. First of all, we need to define the first 16 bits of the limit. Then we need to define the first 24 bits of the base. Then we need to define the present, privilege and type properties, that we can define as a 4-bit structure, and the type flags, which together have a size of 1 byte. Then we need to define the other flags, 4 bit long, and the last 4 bits of the limit, which are all 1s. Finally, we need to define the last 8 bits of the base. We can do the same for the data segment descriptor. The GDT is defined, so we can write an end of GDT label. But we're not over yet. We need to define a GDT descriptor with two entries. The first being the size of the GDT, that we can calculate by doing end minus start minus 1, and a pointer to the beginning of the GDT. As you can see, I added some labels at the beginning of each segment descriptor. I can now use them to calculate the offset of the segment descriptor relative to the beginning of the GDT. We are now ready to switch to 32-bit protected mode. First of all, we will need to disable all interrupts by using the CLI instruction. Then we can load the GDT. This can be done easily by using the LGDT command. Then, to make the actual switch, we need to change the last bit of a special 32-bit register, called CR0, to 1. In order to do this, since we cannot change the value of this register directly, and we can only set it to the value of another register, we need to use a 32-bit general purpose register. These registers are EAX, EBX, ECX and EDX, where E should stand for extended. The 16-bit general purpose register we use until now are just a part of these registers, the lower 16 bits. What we can do to change CR0 is we can move it to EAX, perform a bitwise or operation with 1, which changes the last bit of EAX to 1, and move EAX to CR0. Once we have done this, the CPU is in 32-bit protected mode. We're almost there. What we need to do now is perform what's called a far jump, 
which is a jump to another segment. In this case to our new code segment, offsetted by some label. We now need to define our label, we called it start protected mode, and since we are in 32-bit mode, we should write bits32 before the label. It was not that easy, but we made it. We are in 32-bit protected mode. How do we check? Well, we might do the good old trick and print a character to screen. But oh no, we don't have BIOS anymore. So we now have to write to video memory directly. This is not that hard, since we know that in text mode, video memory starts at hex B8000, and that we just need to write two adjacent bytes, one for the character we want to print and the other one for its color. Yes, we do have colors now. So if we want to print a white on black A to screen, what we need to do is, for example, set AL to A, AH to the color code for white on black, which is hex 0F, and move AX to the beginning of video memory. As you can see, it does print letter A, with a slightly different color, so we most definitely are in 32-bit protected mode. In the next video we're going to switch to C, and for now I'm just leaving you a quite broad exercise. Have a look at the OS Dev Wiki page in the description, and try and experiment with various text and graphics modes. If you manage to do something interesting, tell us in the comments!